that is how you break down a question. Not necessarily write your intro. That is understanding a question. And we've taken about 20 minutes-ish to go through that. That's totally fine. Um, as you're learning how to kind of respond to essays, it might take you a bit of time to figure out what the question is asking you. As you get more confident, especially if you're tuning into this lecture and you're in year 11, that will become significantly more automatic. As you can see, I was getting to this and going like, wait, which one's what? Because it's just something mentally that I skip now. I don't need to do that really detailed. When you're first doing an English essay for a content, doing a history essay, you might spend a bit longer going, okay, this is what I'd probably bring up. It's just going to be less formal as you get more confident. So after going through our kitty steps, you will should, hopefully, understand your question and know what your argument is going to be. That is going to turn into a thesis. That is also going to begin your introduction. All theses have three things. A link to the question, a link to the subject slash rubric slash syllabus, and then your own ad, which is your argument. This link to question and rubric will be referred to as question and your own unique spin will be referred to as expand in the next few slides. And you'll see why in a second. That is because this is the structure of our introduction. Uh, it's a bit silly in terms of, again, like it's less silly, it's more silly than Kitty uh, because it's not an acronym. I just kept using it and then I was like, well, it's kind of a word. It's like quetel, that's not a thing. And then I was like, huh, it's like a petal with the Q. It's not a thing. But if it helps one of you remember the order of an introduction, I see that as an absolute win. Um, so this is the order of an introduction. It almost, as you can see by the colors, mirrors kitty. So keywords to an extent is your question. Expand is almost like your interpretation, kind of. Your topic, you can see, same thing. Your argument is like your content and your link is your elective, right? So your topic is what you're writing about. Your argument will be your body paragraphs. You can see the link a little bit clearer now. But let's go first into what, oh, that's ugly, that text. Um, let's go into what the first two are, right? It's your thesis, question and expand. As I said, every thesis will answer the question, address the rubric, which will be in the question or the syllabus. And then th if you want to, and not all theses will necessarily have this. I've got to go back, please, but that was two minutes ago. Um, you guys should have access, FYI, sorry. Uh, under this, I should have said that, I was too eager to get in. Under this video, there should be slides for you to download. Um, after this video is finished, you'll be able to re-watch re it as well if I've gone too fast. Um, so don't stress too much about that. Anyway, this is your thesis. As I said, it should address the question and therefore address the rubric or syllabus and expand on it if you want to. The expansion is not compulsory. Many essays don't do it. In fact, to get a 20 out of 20, you don't need to necessarily expand. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. This is how an introduction starts. This is a very, very rough structure. Um, don't worry if it seems a bit odd. Uh, it sounds pretty clunky because it's a lot of fill in the blanks. But ultimately your introduction, this is for English might sound something like this, and this would be your thesis. Texts that explore the question allow the audience to reflect on and better understand the question. Indeed, through this examination, a composer may challenge a value in the question, prompting the audience to respond. That's a really, really basic bare bones English thesis. And you can see within this first one, we're linking to the question all the time. You can see that I've said link to question. Link to question, link to question. It may, your thesis may not necessarily look like that. That's totally fine. This is just a really rough example. I find sometimes, uh, especially at the beginning of year 12, a lot of people feel really uncomfortable writing theses. You haven't really spoken about theses and then you get into year 11 and it's like, okay, so your thesis, and it's like, hey, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to write that. And teachers are like, oh, it's just your argument. And it's like, okay, but why give it a special name? 
Writing a thesis can often be one of the hardest parts of an essay because you're putting it into words. So I often find that giving a structure, even if it's very, very genetic, genetic, generic rather, uh, can just be effective in terms of getting, easing you into the process. So that's for an English essay. This might be for a history essay. Uh, question had an impact on question to a great extent as it was able to question. I know that sounds stupid. So let's say uh, uh, ideology had a uh, impact on Soviet foreign policy to a great extent as it gave the nation a driving goal. However, it would be remiss to dismiss leadership of the Soviet Union and it is only through the uh, looking at the whole picture that we can better understand foreign policy in the Soviet Union, for instance. Just because the filling in the blanks there sounded a bit clunkier. Again, this second bit is not necessarily necessary. Uh, if you can get your thesis out straight away and then spend more time just expanding on it by yourself, that is also totally fine. Uh, if I wanted to fill in the blanks for this one, actually, we're going to see one in a second. I don't need to do that. Um, but this is roughly what you can do for, say, a history thesis. Again, it may not sound like that. And to be honest, um, my history thesis didn't sound like that. I was just trying to stick to the same pattern to make it easier for you guys. Uh, essay writing is all about, yes, following a formula, but expressing yourself. And I know that sounds immensely cheesy, um, but it is meant to be conveying your argument. So you can follow this structure initially, but remember it is about your own expression. You get marked on personal voice. Now, what does personal voice mean uh, in subjects in humanities in English? Well, it tends to be about an opinion you're expressing well. When I say your opinion, obviously it doesn't mean you say, I believe X, Y, and Z. We park that at the door. It is all about you having an argument that you're able to back up with evidence doesn't necessarily have to be the most unique argument in the world, uh, but it, it works basically. So let's go back to a natural introduction. Oh, I didn't change the font there. That's a bit sad. Let's go back to this as an introduction. Now you can see immediately there is no yellow in this introduction. Um, if you just tuned in to my Crucible lecture an hour and a bit ago, you will have already seen this introduction. Um, so apologies for that, but hopefully this looks a bit nicer now it's colorful and not a black wall of text. So the question in this case, and let's break it down together. And when I say together, I mean, I will talk and you guys can just listen, um, is this. The purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. Evaluate this statement in relation to your prescribed text. So let's start with number one. Uh, we're going, to, through kitty again, right? So we're starting with our key words. Let's start with one, which is the task word, evaluate. Then we go to the rubric. In this case, it's storytelling. Uh, we talk about the purpose of storytelling or the power of storytelling in this unit in English in New South Wales in year 12. Um, so it's storytelling. Could also be give you questions to think upon, but that may at the very least, if that's not the rubric and it's kind of marginal, um, that is definitely our prescribed focus. Storytelling as a way of giving you questions. <clears throat> and then we go to the audience. What are we meant to be getting out of this essay? Well, it's kind of a bit overlappy, but it is give you questions to think upon as an audience member. Um, so it's a bit overlappy. That looks a bit messy, but that's okay. I then go to I, interpret. Uh, I've already made that link about purpose of storytelling, power of storytelling. So I can say, well, the power of storytelling is to be critical, uh, to challenge you. It's about exploration, right? Um, so, you know, not tell you how to think, give you questions, exploration, uh, queries, you know, those types of things. Um, then we go topic and content. I'm thinking, okay, the topics I'm probably going to talk about here is maybe intolerance, uh, just so I'm not reading out the exact same thing, I'm at say agency, about the importance of not depriving people of agency and maybe the uh, nefarious impacts of power. Um, and they're my eye. Um, 
And then I might move on to, I've got content, that's fine, that's about the quotes, and then I link and I just link it back, right? That's my E. So I, we've gone through Kitty. Then we can now move on to writing our actual introduction. So question and expand. Our qu of our quetel is our thesis. I don't have an E here, so I've really just answered the question in one sentence. And I've said text allow for the challenging of traditional ideas. So I've used a different word there. I haven't said questions to think upon because I'm going to use question in a second. I'm going to use question in the rest of my introduction. So challenging kind of links here. And then I've got traditional ideas, a storyteller, we can see, inviting the audience to question and critically reflect upon their own world. So I reckon I've answered the question there. It's very philosophical. As you'll notice in this one, these ones, it's text that or question had an impact on blah. Um, that's just the way how I wrote my essays. You could start with the crucible allows for a challenging of traditional ideas. This is about the crucible. Um, instead of saying text allow, it really depends on what you feel comfortable with. That is a much of a muchness. You're not going to like fail an essay because you've done something like that differently. You can be successful in either way. I like the sophistication of this, but I also just got used to writing essays and introductions and theses this way. Now we move on to topic. We've skipped expand. I didn't really need it here. We will get to other ones that have a bit of an expand. Um, we move into our topic. So this is basically outlining your essay, providing a bit of context, uh, going into what you're actually going to be talking about. Arthur Miller's The Crucible provides exactly this. I don't, I hate that phrasing. I leave it because I like this intro and it's a good one, but every time I read it, I'm like, Ew. Um, it obviously didn't go badly for me, but I just am like, every time, it's so not like me to say, does this. It's just, ugh. Anyway, uh, with Miller's allegorical dramatic exploration of the witch trials being used to comment on his Cold War American context, prompting the audience to challenge blah, 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 blah. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of that. This is an in the English lecture. Um, and if you did my Crucible lecture a while ago, you've already heard me deconstruct this, so I don't need to do it again. But you can see that I'm bringing up uh, what, what, what am I studying? It's the Crucible. Uh, what's the point of studying it? That type of thing. Then I move on to Miller represents the manipulation of authority. Body paragraph one. The detrimental impacts of societal intolerance. Paragraph two. And the perverse nature of hysteria. Paragraph three. Questioning their continuing relevance. Argument, in this case, similar, con similar to content. It's just, I'm talking about X, Y, and Z. And in case this way of going through it, like speeding through it and going bang, 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 is a bit unfamiliar to you, you can absolutely write essays and introductions like this. So if you're studying something in modern history, you might say the success of the Vietnamese army came down to uh, good local support uh, psychological tactics and the failure of the American offensive. I don't have to go. Uh, the the home support the, uh, the Viet Cong had helped bolster their enthusiasm immensely. Indeed, the poor defensive tactics outlined by them, I can just slide through them. Of course, you can go about the other way, but provided you're giving enough context in this green part, you don't have to keep expanding on those arguments, given that you're going to expand on them straight away in your body paragraphs anyway. Okay, let's take a look at this introduction. We'll go through it again. This isn't a good introduction, as you can see. It's how not to write an introduction. Um, analyze the way form has been manipulated to represent human motivations and desires. Okay, so I can't remember if human motivations and desires is a rubric. I think so. Um, so we have analyze is our first task word. Uh, form is our prescribed. This is English. And then we go represent motivations and desires. I'm pretty sure is the prescribed or it's flipped, but I think it's this way. Um, and then we go, what's the audience in here? What are we meant to be getting out of? It's that representation aspect. So let's have a read of this intro. The composer has the ultimate say and the creation and manipulation of the text. Context, therefore, affects values. Shakespeare's Richard III examines the values of key ideas in light of both contextual and individual understandings. Whilst Pacino examines the same values in Looking for Richard, a comparative study highlights how different contexts shape postmodern concerns of his field. Therefore, both texts are important depictions of power. We kind of have this colour. 
Uh, we have no body paragraphs. There's no blue here because I have no clue what the argument is, right? Um, we have kind of a bit of context we've been given about the text, but like that's being generous. It's really not that green. And this is our red. It's meant to be answering the question. But as we said, we've got form, representation, motivations and desires. Um, I mean, we kind of have composer has the ultimate say, which can maybe be manipulated. But let's be real. Creation and manipulation. There you go. So we kind of have this. There's no mention. I mean, context could be an expansion if we wanted to. That could be an orange. But there's nothing in this intro about that. And there's no body paragraph. So on the whole, it's a bit of an oof, this essay, right? It's not, this intro doesn't tell me what you're saying. It's not following the pattern. Alternatively, we might say something like this. So I have changed. It's not about Richard, just because I've written something else up. This is a lot more colourful, right? We've got a nice gradient rainbow. A composer's manipulation of form, tick straight away, has the capacity for a more nuanced portrayal of human motivations, tick, be it desire for control or ideological unity in a tumultuous time. Bang. We've answered the question. Do we need this yellow bit? Probably not, but let's go through it anyway. Indeed, audiences may better understand the ability of the author themselves through mobilising form, bang, to reflect their own perspectives and motivation for constructing the text. And you can kind of see here, texts that or composers that manipulate form in order to portray, offer a more nuanced portrayal of human motivations are able to something. Indeed, audiences can better understand. You can see I've kind of followed that pattern. Then we move into the content. Um, then we move into the content. Miller's Hybrid Prayer, The Crucible, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then we go into, I think I've stuffed up the blue there. I think the green should carry on all the way down here, but that's okay. That was me doing this on an iPad, unfortunately. Through the utilization of theatrical form techniques and his own personal authority of choosing, Miller divulges the social consequences of desiring absolute power. Critiquing motivation between intolerance and all-consuming hysteria. They're the same body paragraphs, I know. Please give me a break. Thus, by examining Miller's own manipulation of form, our intro, uh, we can better understand the power of text to divulge innate human motivations and desires. Bang. Much nicer and colourful and is answering that question. So we see, we've got the Q, we've got the E. We don't probably need the E. The E is a bit, you know, optional. Got the T. We've got the A. We've got the L. Okay, another introduction. I'm just going to whiz through these because I want to get to body paragraphs, right? Um... Question different words. Cool. Um, modern history paragraph now. To what extent was Lenin a critical factor in the Bolshevik consolidation of power? We can see with this we're going to answer it a bit more straightforward because it's history. English likes a bit of flowery language sometimes, right? We've immediately got to what extent. That's our, you know, one of our Ks. Uh, another one of our Ks is, you know, if critical factor, Bolshevik consolidation of power is our unit that's our um our rubric there so that's our rubric um this landing critical factor is also in the rubric but this is probably our prescribed you know um the audience not really there doesn't matter as much right Lenin was a highly critical factor the bolshevik consolidation of power highly critical bolshevik consolidation of power answered the question pretty immediately it's a bit boring to stop there though so we've expanded slightly more We've explained, we've expanded. Leadership and ideology underpinned all action and activity undertaken by the Bolshevik party up till 1924. We've given some context, we've given some background info. We have, um, we have expanded instead of just leaving it there. 
Then we're gonna move into our topic. So we're explaining it a bit more. So your detail, you get almost more detailed as you go on and then your link takes it back up. I'm so sorry for my ugly arrows. Lenin exerted the highest degree of involvement and or oversight in all diplomatic, political and militaristic matters. This is evident through the significant contributions Lenin made to the consolidation efforts in regards to his early social and political forms, the Treaty of brest the Civil War and War Communism, and the New Economic Policy. They are my three body paragraphs. Through these factors, Lenin clearly demonstrated his indispensability, using a different word, status as a highly critical factor. Going back and answering the question at all times. Again, we're very clearly almost telling a story. We're not telling a story though, because like in essays we're analytical, right? We're not storytelling. However, your responses should flow as if you're telling a story. It should be nice and flowing. It doesn't have to be abrupt and harsh and overly, you know, I guess devoid of any personality. It's about making sure it fits together. That fitting together is just done analytically. I'm gonna skip through this next introduction, but you can see it, you can have a read of it. Um, have a go at trying to pick out the keywords yourself and link through. As you can see with this one, the green kind of goes around, hey? Uh, that's because this is poetry, it's a little bit harder. And another history one, another Bolshevik consolidation of power that wasn't intentional. But you can see this is a nice, very short one. You can see the yellow runs into the green and the blue kind of runs into the purple. There's nothing wrong with that, but all the elements.